we know, we absolutely know, all of us know, that the principles inform psychology in a profound, profound way. Right? That really, they redefine what a human being is. I mean, a human being is what it is, but it, it clarifies what a human being is. That we are spiritual beings, right? And if you just think it in the most simple terms possible, if that's a spiritual fact, that we are spiritual beings, then it changes the whole game of how we help and serve people. It changes all of the rules. It changes the entire premise of what we're doing. You know? It shows us that while we can help people with the details of some of their thinking and so on, there is, there is practical help. Somebody's banging their head against the wall. I think it's fair enough to say stop. You know? But that at a deeper level, we learn to speak to people, to speak to the person behind that presentation, behind the mask. And that's a spiritual experience. And it's, a, it's an experience that's rooted in the spiritual fact that everybody has all the knowledge they need within. That's a spiritual fact. And that's a spiritual fact about who and what human beings are. So when I was at Tikkun this time, I was really moved because I saw that all the beautiful therapists we've known for all these years are moving more and more in that direction a recognition of what the human being really is. To my mind, that's what Sid Banks brought to the world. That's what he demonstrated to the world, was that the human being's power lies much deeper than their intellect, much deeper than their idea of who and what they are here. You know? And it, it brought to the surface to me the point that there are spiritual facts and that when we begin to see those, like everybody in this room is beginning to see those, they're so profoundly simple and yet they tell us everything about complexity. They're so profoundly simple and yet when we go there, when we have that quiet, we see that incredible truth that simplicity gives us to see and under, you know, the word understanding, I, I, I've, I've never had more respect for it because I didn't really, I wasn't getting it as much of what that really meant. Understanding means understanding. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's so much more than the intellect, you know? And Sid lived that. That was, you know, when Elsie was talking, it was like going back in time in a way because I, I remember times when Sid talked that I love, but they're not the times I remember the most, you know? The times I remember the most were like, working in his garden with him, hanging out on the beach, going shopping for a new sports jacket. And like you said, the joy that he experienced in the most simple, mundane, so-called mundane things. You know, He lived in that world and made it visible to us if we wanted to see it. And the whole idea that there's information and a feeling, is, it's hard for some, all of us really at times to get our heads around that. But what's been coming to me in the last little while, particularly, it's been interesting listening to some of Sid's old talks, is that it's impossible to understand who and what you are through your intellect. It's absolutely impossible. It's impossible. But when a beautiful feeling comes, what that is, and you kept pointing to it, I love that, is that that is your true self. And the, way, the only way we can really understand the true self is to simply experience it. And that's what that beautiful feeling is. That's what Sid showed us, is how to experience that. Not how to think about it, talk about it, talk about how you're removed from it, whatever. But to experience that beautiful, beautiful feeling. And, and to know that when you're experiencing that, the, the learning that's happening is enormous. It's absolutely enormous. And I, I've said before, and I, I just love that this sense that 
when you have a moment when the world that you project stops just a fraction of a second, okay, the learning that happens in that fraction of a second is just enormous. You know, it's you going home. Being home is the only way to understand home. And yet, when we go home, all of our thinking is automatically reordered. There's nothing to fix. You know? That doesn't mean to say that we won't re-engage in our habits and everything. That th but, but see, that doesn't matter. More and more, that I see how that doesn't matter that we go in and out. It doesn't matter. It's like you're on the train and you're going in and out, but the train's still on the tracks, and you're still going home. You know? And that's very, very comforting. And it's really beautiful because you begin to see that there's nothing to fix. There's nowhere to go. There's no need for a goal. You know, the only goal is to just relax and live your life and experience those feelings. I remember very clearly the time I thought I, I mean, I'd had our lives were getting better in the beginning. Jan and I's marriage, which was a total wreck when we met Sid was like in the matter of two or three weeks we were living in a honeymoon. It was just, it was overnight. It was unbelievable. And I, I, I it was really interesting because I, I had no frame of reference for it. I didn't know what happened. Like I knew I was feeling that way, but I couldn't understand why, you know, or where all that stuff went that we were into. It was just, it disappeared and, and all of a sudden we just had this honeymoon. It was like, what happened? And then I had my first, like, real, not one of my first, but a, a real solid insight. I went, oh, wow, you know? And I think it was about thought as well. I actually don't remember what it was. But I remember getting really excited, right? And I, I called Sid, and, and there was no answer. But I, I just felt I had to talk to Sid. So I jumped in my truck, and I, I drove across the island and went shooting down Sid's driveway, probably a little bit too fast, kicking up dust. I just couldn't <laughs> wait to tell him about this experience, right? And I get down to the bottom of the driveway, and I knew what he was doing. It was like Saturday, so I knew what he'd be doing. He'd be cutting his grass or working in the lawn. And sure enough, he was pushing the lawn more, right? So I jump out of the truck, and I go, Sid, Sid, you know, I'm going to tell you about this insight that I had. And he looks at me, and he goes like this. And I go, yeah, but, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, doesn't he want to hear? I mean, he's been trying to tell me something, I finally... And he just walked away from me, and he went in the house, and he got his dog, and we went walking through the woods. And I thought, well, he's looking for like a better place for me to tell him what I realized. <laughs> <laughs> we, we walked through the woods, and we walked for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, and we came out to a clearing on the ocean. It's like the weather we have now is one of those really sparkly, sparkly days. And we went out and we sat on the edge of this ledge looking out at the sea. And Sid just sat there and just looked out at the sea. And I just settled down and I sort of got the idea that we weren't going to talk about anything. <laughs> and I started looking out at the sea. And I looked over at Sid he was looking out at the sea, and tears were just streaming down his face. So anyway, there was something about that that just, just leveled me emotionally. I just lost it, you know. And it was the very first time in my entire life that I felt I didn't need anything. that there was nothing missing, that I wasn't broken. I mean, these are afterthoughts. I just know that the feeling was that in that moment, my life was perfect. All life was perfect. And I looked back out at the sea, and we sat there for about 15 or 20 minutes. And Sid jumped up and brushed himself off. I followed him back. We walked through the word, woods and never said a word. 
got to his yard, he went over and fired up his lawnmower and started cutting the grass, and I drove home. <laughs> and that's my very favorite moment with Sid. And I share it because, obviously, not a word said, but I know that I learned more in that moment than I did in my entire life leading up to it. My entire life. And so, one of the beautiful things about the school is that it's here to preserve the mystery as well. The mystery of how an ordinary guy walking along in his life, minding his own business, and the wisdom of the ages is just struck into him or out of him. I don't even know how to explain it. Just that there's, there's a mystery there and it should be a mystery. And when we see it as a mystery, it, it elevates our level of respect because it's not just something conjured up through thinking. Something much more powerful, much more profound. It is the touch of God on humanity. Now, I'm not a religious person. I really am not. But I know that it's the touch of God in humanity. It's God's way of coming, whatever you want to call God. I mean, I don't care. The energy of all things, whatever you think it is. But it's, it's that ultimate true self, the oneness that's in all of us, coming to, surface, to the surface to give us some help, <laughs> you know, to show us that there is a way. You know. There is a way to come to understanding. You know. And it's not out there anywhere. It's inside each and every human being. And all we have to do is be interested in and be willing to sit together and with people who know that that exists. It's like when you all walked in here last night, it was already here. I mean, I laughed on the way home. It's like everybody could go home tomorrow and all we did is had a cup of coffee. You know what I mean? It was here. And it's here right now. There is such a thin veil between the world that we think is real with this and the spiritual world. It's a very thin veil. It's so thin as to not exist. And we just project some thinking on it. We keep it alive. We all do that. I mean, that's part of being human is that we have our idea of being alive individually. But that's, that veil is very, very thin. Like right in this moment, right now, it cannot exist. That oneness that we feel when we sit together and we think about what's upstream from all of our worries and all of our troubles, when we go there together, the learning is profound. It'll take you a lifetime to unreal that learning. And I know that every printed word that Sid put out, every recording he ever put out, has that power in it. Has the power to take you home. Has the power to remind you that no matter what's going on in your life, in this moment, you have everything you need. We all do. We all do. We have the wisdom to sort out anything in our lives. Anything in our lives. You know, one of the big surprises to me about learning this way was I was amazed that my life, my day-to-day -day life could change so much. I was amazed that my perspective on what would come in the future would just change completely, just to just be open. What I didn't expect what I didn't expect was that my past would change. It's kind of odd, isn't it? You know, I was shocked to look back at my past after things started to change and see so much more beauty that I'd forgotten about. I concentrated so much on bad things that had happened to me and my family and stuff and the way I grew up. And it was a shock for me to suddenly look back 
and see that there was so much beauty. There was courage. There was wisdom. There was kindness. And I had missed it all. Uh, if I hadn't missed it, I blocked it out. Right? You know how they talk about when we, people um, will repress. Say, repress. Yeah, repress uh, uh, traumatic experience. I can, I can assure you I never repressed one traumatic experience in my life. I had it down all very in technicolor. But what I had suppressed was the beauty that had been around me. Sometimes people will go, they'll end their life and, and be finished with this life here and they, they still haven't forgiven or, or forgot, you know, on their deathbeds they're still like that. And I grew up that way. You know, that was kind of my family's way of life. It was the family culture, is that you never forgave anybody for doing something to you or saying something that wasn't nice to you. And, and they would cultivate that the whole time. And so you just lived in this world of, I remember when he said this 50 years ago, and <laughs> you know. So the gift, I know we tend to take it for granted. But the gift of really seeing thought in regard to the past is, is amazing. If that was the only thing we saw in this journey, how to, how to for, you know, not forget the past, but as you say, you know, you understand the understand past. Understand the past. You understand the past. And so you have a different perspective on it. And so what looked like trauma and was trauma in the moment with understanding, you can look at it and you can see it, you know, just without attachment. You can see it with neutrality. And I think that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. If just that one thing, mm -hmm. if you saw that. You know, you and I were talking the other day, Chip, about the living of it, you know, seeing as this has been part of the conversation and how more and more that's become our life, is just living in simplicity. And even when we're doing things and traveling and all that, there's a simplicity about that. There's an ease about that. Nothing seems too complicated anymore. Everything just seems to flow. And if it doesn't, like even that then is taken care of. You know, whatever challenges come your way, you, you have, you're more able to flow with the challenges. And, and we were both saying, Chip was saying something about happiness. Mm -hmm. And I, I was saying just the simplicity of loving my life, just being content in my life, not trying to figure out why, which is what I used to do. Why am I so happy? <laughs> God, you know, I've been so good for like a whole week now. I've been really enjoying my life. I wonder why. And then I'd wonder why I wasn't feeling so good anymore. <laughs> you know, and I'd wonder why. Why did I just dip? Hmm. Is that dip lower than it was, you know, <laughs> a week before? And I'd start to compare, you know, all that. You know, what mood, what level? But the, the living life without as much thought in it, where there's just more living and not a lot of thought. And I know that doesn't make sense on one level because we're always, we're thinking creatures, so we're always thinking and creating in the moment. What it really means is extraneous thought. There's no extraneous thought. You're living in creation as it happens. That's what it is. You're living in creation as it happens. And there's a simplicity about that. That, that was a good one. I like that. <laughs> It's a definition of faith. Say more about that. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. No, it is. It's a definition of faith, and it's also become my definition of freedom. See, I, Jan and I were doing a business training once, and we were talking about the ability to just live in the now and, and, and really see what's going on in front of you rather than think about what's going on in front of you. So we were giving this talk in this business setting, and this guy who uh, 
He was a really neat guy. He was one of these super high energy guys that was in marketing and everything, and, and everybody really liked him. He was a jokester, you know. But all of a sudden, he just he kind of turned white, and he he jumped up and he said, "Oh my God!" He said, "I've lived subservient to my thinking for my whole life. Mm -hmm. I, I've I've been subservient to my thinking for my whole life." And his boss and all these people were like, "What are you talking about?" And he just all of a sudden, he was explaining that, that basically your intellect's there to serve you to do what you see needs doing, right? And that a quiet state of mind brought the clarity to see what was important. It was the most amazing thing, right? And, and that's kind of what I like when I say freedom, too. It's like freedom from all of that overthinking and judging and searching and looking for something. It's the most amazing thing. That, that has become my definition of freedom. On days when I really feel that, I, I feel like I'm as free as the wind. You know? And everybody has that capacity. There's nothing you have to think about, you know. Did you know that? There's actually nothing you have to think about. You know? And it's like, sometimes when I first started talking about that in, in my career, people would say, well, is that, is that like anti-intellectual? You know, and I'd say, no, actually, the intellect is a profound and powerful tool, right? But if you're caught up in living in the relativity of your thinking, you lose the power of that tool. You get quiet and you see clearly, then you use the intellect for what it was meant to do, it was to just be that. Like, so many times in, in business, people would just all of a sudden become so much more creative and have so many new, fresh ideas. And they, they, they were like, what's this, you know? Well, it's, it's easy. Like, you were doing this before, round and round and round, and it's all relative, and you've got all this judgment. And all of a sudden, your mind is quiet, and you see all with clarity, and you take your intellect and you use it just to really do what needs to be done, you know? You know one of the most amazing examples of that? was when Jan and I were working in the prisons, okay? We're in this women's prison. And after maybe a month of doing trainings in the prison, other people who did other classes, like GED classes and, and other kinds of training, started coming up and telling us that these women were doing so much better. They couldn't understand. Women who had not even been willing to pick up a pencil and write were now getting great grades and doing really well. And, and, I, and I had to think about it. You know, and it just became clear. It's like, just picture this. Talk about freedom. Picture feeling guilt and shame. You've lost your kids. You're locked up in jail. You've messed up your life. Your parents are disappointing. If that's your entire belief system, can you imagine sitting down trying to learn with that rolling through your head constantly? You know, and all of a sudden they're free. They have the freedom from that, and they go, oh. That's, what, that's how this works in math, or this is how this works. And they start to enjoy learning. They didn't enjoy it before because they didn't experience it. You know? And it's no different to have some executive who's been caught up in the politics at work and thinking all kinds of things and you know, being worried about where we're going and how we're going to do it. If they could let go of that, it really is no different. That's why, to me, what we're learning about just having a quiet mind quiet life represents freedom, represents the most profound freedom I can imagine. And it's, it translates directly to faith. You know, because faith to me is a lot like, if you don't have to worry about it, then you have faith. If you don't have to figure it out, then you have faith. And it's not blind faith. It's the faith of seeing and understanding and knowing, yeah, that's what's happening. That's not blind faith. That's knowledge. <coughs> and it's fun. Sometimes. It's fun. Yeah. You know, it just. It is. Like that was something I also saw with Sid in terms of that change in his personality. I don't recall him being um, necessarily, a, you know, having a great sense of humor in the er when I first <laughs> met him and when he was working at the mill with Ken. I don't recall actually either one of them having a great sense of humor, <laughs> nor did I in those days, because what was there to be, you know, humorous about? Life was hard. Don't forget, you know, it's like 
ain't it awful? Mm -hmm. So when you've got an ain't it awful culture, there's not a lot of humor in ain't it awful. And, and that really changed for, for Sid. I noticed that, that, you know, he had this, this humor. He would call it cosmic yeah, humor. Yeah. And he just, like, there were things that were really funny that really struck him. And I, I, it took me a little while to catch it. But I love when that happens, when your life is light. And as a, a friend says, that there's more leg room in your mind. <laughs> I love that. It's an original <laughs> phrase. That's great. That's from really a, a friend of ours, and that just really speaks to it. More leg room in my mind. And so there is this, like the closet genius that Sid used to talk about. For, uh, he was referring to us in those days, mm -hmm. because so many of, of the folks that first started to listen to Sid were people that were kind of on the edge, were, were sort of surviving and, and living, uh, some moving away from society and trying to find their way in alternative lifestyles and so on. And I remember very clearly Sid talking to all of us, uh, your society, he said to us. You know, you can't move away from society, your society. You take yourself wherever you go. And that was such a beautiful thing to see then. In, in a way, what happened on Salt Spring Island in the early days was like the first community project. Yeah without labeling it a community project because their, their people were living, as I say, on the edge. And as they found this new understanding and confidence in themselves and new ideas took hold, they started businesses and uh, shops, retail shops, and did all kinds of things that had never occurred to them before. And they become, became really productive citizens. So that was really the first community project. And that really started to change all of Salt Spring Island. And again, it was the proof of the pudding. Sid was, the fir was really the first individual proof of the pudding in what happened to him as he uncovered this, these principles. But then as it started to extrapolate to more of the people that were drawn to study with him, then it moved out into the community and so on. And now you see it move out into the global community in the same way that people are just finding new ways of service, you know, how to help. Mm -hmm. And even if you've not necessarily uh, been an expert in a particular field and an opportunity comes along, you find that you can do it. Even though you may not know the exact technology, like when I was invited to work in business, I knew nothing about business. But what I could offer was a level of understanding about the principles and about life. And, and that's, that's, our, that's our education that really counts. It's not that all the rest of it doesn't count, too. But if you have that as your foundation, your understanding, and your ability to, to nurture insight, to nurture your true self, to allow your true self to emerge more and more, that service of the highest degree mm -hmm. to the world, and in the simplest way. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing more important than that that you can do for the world, yeah. for sure. 